reported. You're listening to East Bay Yesterday, the podcast that looks back at stories from Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, and other towns throughout Alameda and Contra Costa County. This show is about history, but it's not stuck in the past. Let's begin. Let's begin. Here's a quick little experiment. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. When you hear the words Black Panther Party, what's the first image that pops into your mind? I'm guessing for many of you, it was this. A black man or several with afros, maybe wearing leather jackets, probably holding guns, looking tough. Does that sound about right? The Black Panther's longest running program, however, was a children's school run mostly by women. From 1973 until 1982, the Oakland Community School was one of the best and most visionary schools in the Bay Area. It was praised by Governor Jerry Brown and the California State Legislature for setting, quote, the standard for the highest level of elementary education. It attracted famous visitors, including Rosa Parks, James Baldwin, Richard Pryor, Cesar Chavez, Willie Mays, and Sun Ra, who helped raise funds, or sometimes teach classes, or even, in the case of Maya Angelou, develop after-school programs that were shared with other public schools throughout Oakland. One scholar who wrote a book about the Black Panthers titled Living for the City called the school arguably the party's most important organizing legacy and also one of its least studied. Erica Huggins ran the school for nearly its entire existence. I asked her why she thinks the Oakland Community School has been so overlooked. We live in a country as well as the world. It's very male-centered and focused on image. And a school is an everyday take care of children thing. Gregory Lewis is currently a lawyer living in Oakland, but he was born into the Black Panther Party and attended the school until he was nine years old. What was always emphasized about the Panthers was the male party leadership. You know, Bobby Sill, Huey Newton, and Eldridge Cleaver, and, you know, various uh, male leaders. But what I experienced was the power of the female leaders who ran the school behind the scenes. And here's Rod Gilead. He's a retired, lifelong educator who also lives in Oakland. His first teaching job was at the Oakland Community School during the mid-1970s. Here's what it was like there at the time. Huey was in exile. Bobby Seale was back in, in Philadelphia. And the, the ladies were running the party. So Elaine Brown was the uh, chair of the party. And then practically all the functionaries at the school were females, uh, very much oriented towards serving the community and the like. So, you know, it's a very different picture than what the media was putting out. The reasons why Panther co-founders Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were both out of the picture during the heyday of the school are complicated. But there's a lot to be learned from looking at these so-called lost years of Black Panther history and not just about the party. The Oakland Community School was facing so many of the same problems that continue to plague America's education system. In many ways, Erica Huggins and her comrades solved these problems 40 years ago, but many of those lessons have been forgotten. Here's Erica again. People are very enamored 
of the first few years of the Black Panther Party where there were men in uniform and where there were speeches and talks and less about our programs that impact the community. And when I bring it up to journalists, the school and all of the other, there were 65 programs community survival programs of the Black Panther Party, but often when I bring up the program, people say, I don't have time for that. Well, today we're going to make time for that. And trust me, it's not gonna feel like homework. On today's East Bay Yesterday, the history of the Oakland Community School. I'm your host, Liam O'Donoghue, stay tuned. ago, Erica Huggins mentioned the Black Panther Social Services, which were known as Community Survival Programs. Calling them survival programs was not an exaggeration. We started the Coalition Against Infant Mortality when we found out that Oakland had higher rates of infant death in the first year of life than many Sub-Saharan African Country. This was in 19, the mid 1970s. And we went to the county board of supervisors together parents, babies, children. And because we went to the county board of supervisors and we were heard, things began to change. In other words, this wasn't just politics, it was life and death. There were huge gaps between what people needed to survive and what they actually had. The Panthers filled those gaps with senior assistance programs, free health clinics, and other social services. From the very beginning, the party emphasized the importance of better schools and creating healthier, stronger communities. Point number five in the party's 10-point program said, quote, We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in present day society. Rod Gilead learned what that meant when he first visited the school by watching how the other teachers interacted with their students. I was just impressed with the sensitivity that they had towards not having what happened to them in school happen to the children under their charge. So the, uh, the focus was on raising healthy kids that knew who they were, what their history was, and what they themselves could do with their lives. And when you say that they didn't want what happened to them to happen to these kids, what do you think was their main critique of like the mainstream education system in the United States? Well, well, first of all, most of us, and, and most of them too, didn't go to schools that were dominated by African American teachers, all right? And the consensus was that they didn't learn much about their history. They weren't encouraged to be inquisitive minds. As a matter of fact, those that were like that were pretty much shut down. According to Erica Huggins, the Oakland Community School took an opposite approach. They wanted the kids to question everything. And carrying out the principle that the world is a child's classroom and the idea that children should learn how, not what to think, we wanted them to think about what they'd been taught before the school if they were older children, uh, what TV and other forms of media were teaching them about themselves or people that look like them. Is that true? Can you say that all people are like this or all people are like that? This question everything approach was one pillar of the school's philosophy. But Erica Huggins knew that the kids needed confidence for this to work. Most of the students were poor children of color. And here's why that fact matters. Because kids in poor communities are more likely to go to schools that are falling apart. 
with cramped classrooms and lacking music and art and even sports programs. While at the same time, in the same city, kids in wealthier neighborhoods go to schools with far more resources. This isn't a newsflash, but just think about how that makes the kids at the poor schools feel about themselves. Building up the students' self-esteem was another major pillar of the Oakland Community School. It's about feeling that you're great no matter what body you're born into or the color of it or the texture of the hair or the shape of the eyes or the height or the weight that we're each individually perfect African-American and other children of color are not taught that. And I would say that poor white children are not taught that they're great based on class and status. Here's Gregory Lewis talking about how what he learned as a Panther cub stayed with him even after his family left the party. What the Panther education and everything helped me with is I never... Uh, I never doubted myself. I was very self-aware. I was very, you know, I was put into different situations where not only I was young, not only I was the only black, you know, the N-word was freely thrown around. There was Mexican gangs. There was all kinds of situations that the the reality of the Panther lifestyle and the, and the, the things that we saw from going to prison, visiting real political prisoners or real people who had been incarcerated wrongfully and maybe who did have to become these dangerous, violent people just to survive of what that meant. And for me, you know, if my friends were going to do something extremely illegal that might land up in jail, I'm like, see ya. That's not, that's not, there's nothing romantic at all about ending up in jail, especially if you're not fighting for a cause. Edwards Teagert here. I'm going to use this music break to hop in with a quick piece of business. Uh, East Bay Yesterday is one of my favorite new shows that we've brought to the airwaves here at KPFA. I learned something from every episode that Liam puts together for us. And if it's something that, that you've been enjoying and you're excited about too, we need you to show your support with a pledge this hour. So we can turn around and show that to the powers that be here. The way you do that is you call 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at www.kpfa.org. Um, I read a lot of local history. Um, I, I thought I knew a lot of Oakland history. I'm embarrassed to say I knew almost nothing about this chapter of the Black Panther Party's history in the East Bay and the Oakland Community School. I could not be more grateful to, to learn about it from Liam and from KPFA. And I think it speaks to the importance of supporting an institution like this. There, there are not a lot of profits to be made making history relevant to the presence, but there is so much riding on it. So we got about 60 seconds till we go back. Uh, we just had one caller hop on the line. Thank you. I want you to remember this number and call as the show continues. It's one 800 Four three nine five seven three two. We don't have any fancy thank you gifts to to dangle in front of you because of the logistics of running a fun drive during a pandemic. Um, but we do have one incentive to make that pledge right now, which is that an anonymous donor in Oakland has teamed up with James in San Jose, and they have offered to double a thousand dollars. If we can raise a total of at least 1,000 to match them this hour. Uh, the clock on that $1,000 challenge starts right this second. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. If you need to remember it, it's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. If you do need to shop around through our limited selection of thank you gifts, you can go to kpfa.org because we're going back to East Bay yesterday. Nowadays, there's a lot of skepticism about the idea that schools should focus on building kids' self-esteem. Some people think that coddling students hurts them because it doesn't prepare them to survive in the real world. Well, 
the ways that the Panther School helped kids empower themselves has nothing to do with the cliched everybody gets a trophy for participation type culture that you might be thinking of. Here's one example. After lunch, we meditated for a few minutes. I learned to meditate when I was in prison. I told the children that. They believed me. They, they knew that they felt good when they sat down and, and focused on their breathing. We didn't have a curriculum for it. We just sat and breathed together and, and were quiet for a while. That's all it took. Eric Hoggins is the one who created this program. And, you know, I remember the first time she talked about this. We're all looking at each other like, oh, this is, what? what? We're supposed to be out in the playground running around and, you know, jumping and throwing the ball. The last thing we want to do is calm ourselves right now. You know, basically we would go in and she'd be sitting at the class and then she would, you know, instruct us to come in and sit and essentially to breathe in and breathe out. And like I said, at first we were squirmy, we were, you know, and I for one was like not having it, but then it was Erica Huggins up there. And then so after a while, I really began to like breathe and get deep and meditate at this young age. I just want to drop a little footnote in here. There's been a 40% increase in diagnoses of ADHD in American kids over the past eight years. Kids from low-income families are the most likely to be diagnosed. Okay, back to Erica Huggins. I think that the people who say that um, children from low-income neighborhoods are unruly or unfocused have forgotten what poverty does to a human being, have forgotten what racism does to a human being. And what the children who sat quietly after lunch every day at Oakland Community School recognize that no matter what anybody says, no matter what is happening external to them, there is still their own power within that they can access any time of day. That's how we talked about it. We were just saying, try this. It worked. It worked. It got, and for me, it got me through uh, 14 months of sitting in a cell by myself. What Gregory learned during those sessions has stayed with him throughout his entire life. It is that self-reflection moment and that even taking a deep breath that allows you to be prepared for most situations. Here's one more example of how the school helped build confidence, and it's pretty much the exact opposite of sitting perfectly still. It also shows a possible solution to another problem that plagues so many schools, violence. Here's former teacher Rod Gilead again. Another big outlet was the martial arts program. Again, in hindsight, I look at that as a very effective discipline, self-discipline way. Because, first of all, it helped them center. It also pretty much eliminated violence, all right, because... The, the, the basic tenet was you have enough knowledge of how to prevent needing to use violence. But if you have, you can, you know, you have that tool, but it's a last resort. But the older boys were in competition with other martial arts groups. And because I had a Volkswagen van, I could fit seven or eight kids and take them. So on Saturdays, I would go to the meets and they were slaying these other schools. I mean, slaying them. All right. And they were so skilled and confident. And here we are, you know, we're maybe, you know, several hundred uh, uh, students are competing. We're only black students there. And we're walking away with all the trophies. <laughs> in liberation education. And if you use Perlo Freire's term, most public schools are in the banking business, all right? Basically, we got an empty vessel here, we're gonna fill them up with knowledge. That wasn't ours. 
philosophy. Our philosophy was, look, all right, we want inquisitive kids. We want kids who question. We want kids to figure it out on their own. We want kids that help each other learn. All right. Well, you know, in public school, you help another kid, you're cheating. <laughs> you know? So, again, it, it's, it's a very different approach. This sense of camaraderie is one of the things that Gregory Lewis remembers most. It was jarring when he was transferred to a traditional Oakland middle school. Fast forwarding when I got to public school, it was more competition, you know, and less about the, the, communal, uh, the communal good. One of the reasons why Gregory was so shaken by this transition is because until he was nine years old, he had grown up completely surrounded by Black Panther culture. His father, Greg Sr., was one of the original Panthers who carried guns into the state capitol building. Greg Jr. was almost assassinated by the OPD before he was even born. His mother, Pamela, was pregnant with him and working at the Panther office at 65th and International when the cops opened fire on the place. Gregory grew up in a communal living situation with other Panther cubs and ate his meals with them too. Here's a clip of Huey Newton from a documentary talking about why it was so important for the Panthers to incorporate their free meals program into the school. They used to serve cookies and uh, I think graham crackers and milk in the morning uh, to, to uh, children uh, in primary school who had the money to pay for it. And if you didn't have the money to pay for it, you had to put your head on the desk until the other kids uh, finished eating. I always thought that was uh, very bad, but at the open community school, everybody eats. It should be noted that the federal government did not serve free breakfasts to poor kids until after the Panthers got tons of good publicity for their program. Politicians in D.C. realized that the Panthers were making them look bad. The United States was basically shamed into making sure little kids weren't going hungry. And the rest is history. But back to Oakland. Everybody I talked to agreed. It was the community aspect of the school that was the key to its success. The difference within the classroom was that a lot of the teachers were either our parents, our friends' parents, uh, someone who mentored me or who, you know, was, was a whole level of respect and understanding that each group from the parent group to the student group that they had that I think made it so much more so much more of a connection. Like we were all we were all kind of connected. And I think that's a difference with education, especially when I left, is you don't feel connected with your teachers. Now, the term community has become so overused that it can be hard to remember sometimes what it even means. So here's a real example, courtesy of Erica Huggins. We engaged the community and brought parents in as volunteers if they had to be at home with younger children and couldn't work. And we helped people to see that they could go back to school and become a teacher aide. Gregory's mom was only 17 years old when she had him. Once he started attending the school, she started helping out there and eventually went on to be the first person from her family to graduate college. She retired a few years ago after a lifelong career as a teacher. pop out for another quick fundraising update here. Um, if you've been with us for a few minutes, you know, two of our listeners have challenged us to raise $1,000 during East Bay yesterday today. If we hit that $1,000 mark, they will double it. I've got good news and bad news on that front. Um, we, we did get an early flurry of calls, clocked $220 towards the challenge. But just in the past couple minutes, we dropped to zero callers on the line. And uh, zero will not add up to the $780 we still have to raise if we want to make it. So we're asking you to come through for your radio station and to pledge while you're showing support for East Bay yesterday at 1-800-439-5732. Uh, you'll be joining Robert, who just pledged from Santa Cruz, and Rebecca, who just pledged from Kentfield and said, I do love this show on the East Bay. It's very valuable. I've been a KPFA listener since 1961 when I was born. Um, amazing to have you with us on this journey, Rebecca. 
and to everyone else who's listening, Rebecca's given so that KPFA can be here for you. And what we're asking you to do is return the favor. We've got two really generous listeners standing by to double your contribution if we can hit that $1,000 challenge. All it takes is two minutes of your day. Pick up the phone and call one 800 439 Five seven three two. There's one caller. Uh, we've got about two and a half minutes left to convince some of you to join them. I'm going to bring in Liam O'Donohue, the creator of East Bay, yesterday to help me out. Hey, Brian, how's it going? I am really hoping that by the time ballots are hitting mailboxes here in the East Bay, uh, we will be done taking pitch breaks so we can do full time coverage of the most consequential election of our lifetime. Uh, But that is largely a function of how many people call right now at 1-800-439-5732. Pledge while you have a chance to help us make a shorter fun drive. Liam? Well, I have a feeling that your uh, wishes are going to be answered because, Brian, as you know, you and I have, uh, you know, done fundraising pitches together uh, many, many times in the past now. And I believe we have an unbroken streak of hitting our goal every single time we've teamed up. So um, I know it's not going to happen magically. We need people to call in right now. But uh, I feel like we've got a pretty good record to stand on. And I think we can make it happen again today. But again, uh, as you mentioned, it will take uh, some people to call in right now in order for us to keep that unbroken streak uh, alive and to hit that fundraising goal. So once again, the number is 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And, uh, you know, as you were alluding to, we need um, KPFA's coverage now more than ever. Uh, You know, we're really at an unprecedented time in our country right now, and we need uh, independent voices, non-corporate voices, critical voices uh, on the radio, in the media more than ever, because I think as we um, are seeing again, as we saw in 2016, we can't leave it up to, uh, you know, the big the big boys, the big media networks to uh, keep us safe from, uh, you know, where our country is going right now under President Trump. And it is very, very scary out there. Just about 45 seconds left on this break. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We're up to two callers on the line. Um, Our tally's changed. We're now at $660 to go to make that challenge. Uh, Do it while you're showing support for East Bay yesterday. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. Let's go back to the show. Now, community building can't just be about all this positive, uplifting stuff, right? The flip side, of course, is accountability. People mess up occasionally, and there needs to be discipline. The Oakland Community School had a solution to this problem as well. Here's Rod Gilead again. Generally, you walk into the principal's office, there's some little black boy or brown boy sitting there feeling dejected, looking like he's in hell, all right? So when I got to um, Oakland Community School, that never existed, all right? Uh, First of all, the overwhelming majority of kids were happy to be there. And then when there were infractions, if you will. The adults didn't take care of it. The students took care of it. The concept here was simple. If a student got caught breaking the rules, he or she would have to explain themselves to a panel of their peers. The Justice Board would also decide on the punishment. Here's Gregory Lewis giving the students perspective. You've got your classmates or these students who you really respect or saying, why would you, why would you do that? Why would, you know, you know, you're not supposed to do, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And so we really respected the words of our classmates. So with it being uh, classmate driven, kind of allowed us also to maybe have some discourse with the people who are disciplining us and not feel like there's just this big, again, this big separation between, you know, getting punished right away versus at least getting an explanation of why you can't have dessert tonight. Compare this approach to what happened to Gregory a few years later. He was attending a junior high in Hayward and asked the question, what is masturbation? It didn't go so well. I hadn't gone through puberty. I wouldn't go through puberty three years later. And so here I am, right? Here I am in science class. I raised my hand and 
Uh, the teacher's face just turns red. Mr. Gordon's like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, he ended up in the principal's office for that one. There's another thing that Gregory learned after leaving the Oakland Community School that I want to bring up because it totally debunks the myth that the Black Panther Party hated white people. Gregory actually laughed when I asked him about this because he said he had way more contact with white people during his days in the Panther School versus when he switched to a regular public school in North Oakland. When I got to public school, for example, from from the Panther School, I met friends who had never had any white friends before. I'd never been to a white person's house, quote unquote. And I'm like, what are you talking, what? Like, what? like that didn't make sense to me. Because we're in Oakland, right? In Oakland at that time, it's like it was still segregated in that way. That was not the Panther reality. Like, we went to so many multicultural events and, you know, comrades who were white, comrades who were Latino, comrades who were Asian. Brad Gilead told me that white and Latino kids from the neighborhood also attended the Oakland Community School. And he also mentioned where a lot of the misconceptions about the party come from. This notion that they were hateful was, you know, I mean, read, read their 10 point program. All right. It ain't about hate nobody. All right. And it's not against anybody, but it's for the liberation of people that are oppressed. And then when you consider J. Edgar Hoover's COINTEL program, he put all that garbage out there. COINTEL Pro? was the abbreviated name of the counterintelligence program that the FBI launched to discredit and destroy the Black Panther Party. Ultimately, it was pretty successful. When we get back, the return of Huey Newton, the end of the school, and a brief visit to a POW camp. Stay tuned. The original name of the party was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. The reason for this name and for why Huey Newton and Bobby Seale started the party in the first place is because the police in Oakland and many other parts of the country were getting away with brutalizing and murdering African Americans constantly. The first Panther missions were community patrols to watch the police and to try to stop their abuse. I bring this up to give some context to the story you're about to hear. It's the story of why Rod Gilead decided to leave the job he loved. The day that I decided to leave, there was something happened in the community and the police surrounded the school and Haven said, Everybody has to man a station. Sorry to interrupt, but Haven was another teacher at the school. Okay, back to the story. And I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't buy into this. And there was one individual. Now, I never thought anything of it until this time. Uh, I think his name was Big Bob. Big Bob was about six foot seven, 300 pounds. And he always wore a full-length overcoat. That day, when they, basically the members of the party, went outside and manned the, all the stations, I stayed with the kids. Big Bob opened up his coat, and there was an arsenal inside. You know, shotguns and handguns and stuff. I said, no, fuck this, this ain't for me. Now, I don't know exactly what the incident was, but what I understand is the guy who ever did whatever he just put an all alert out. So whatever happened, it resolved itself. And I was like, you know, this, this, is, this is too dangerous. Gregory's family didn't decide to leave the party as a direct result of this particular incident. But the tense atmosphere around the party was taking its toll. Eventually, though, after a brief glimpse of hope, it was just too much. I think it was absolutely related to that kind of 
stress and threat of instability from, you know, a lot of it was from the male power structure, really. You know, Huey had come back from Cuba. The, there was a big parade for him to come back, you know, and for us kids, that was like a mate. Like, you know, so many of our fallen heroes were dead. We're like, oh, the man's coming back. We get to meet him, you know. I had a very seminal moment of doing the hand bone, hand bone with him, you know, after he came back, he sat down with us in the in the back you know, in the auditorium and um, uh, taught us how to, you know, Hamble, Hamble, where you been? <laughs> and then, uh, and, you know, had us do it. And so it really felt like, wow, Huey's back. Like, we're going to, this is going to be forever. We are good. But for my mom behind the scenes, I know it was, it became even more stressful probably when Huey came back because here we had this very successful, functional highly achieving model that had nothing to do with him and perhaps ego stepped in and, and all kinds of other issues. I know that when my mom left, it was time. And I know that like my stepdad tells me a little more, he has a little more insight with just how, you know, crazy people, there was a lot of paranoia and, you know, you also have to talk about COINTELPRO and you have to talk about the FBI infiltration and everything. So that a lot of that paranoia we find out was absolutely justified. Again, Rod Gilead. Soon after I left the party, so I left the party, in, I mean, not the party, left the school in 76. Sometime in the early 80s, when Yui came back, many of my colleagues start leaving the party. And several of them called me and said, can I stay with you? I'm leaving the party. I can't tell anybody. Can I hide out? And so several of them came and stayed with me before they either moved back or, or moved on. During this era, Huey Newton wasn't the same man he was 10 or 15 years earlier. He'd survived being shot, many months in solitary confinement, and a covert FBI offensive designed to destroy him. There's already been a lot written about the Panthers unraveling Huey Newton's violent, unstable leadership. But the point is that when the party disintegrated, it took the school down with it. In 1982, because um, the party, the Black Panther Party, was no longer able to support it, I think that the FBI's counterintelligence program was successful in doing what it intended, that is to neutralize people in leadership. And sometimes that looked like an assassination or a jailing, and sometimes it looked like and addiction. So people were suffering and in the leadership of the Black Panther Party and the school suffered. The children didn't suffer, but the school's infrastructure began to suffer. And so I left. And it was the most difficult time of my life. Brian Edwards Teekert here. We're going to take a couple minutes away from East Bay yesterday to ask for your help to support the radio station that brings you this program over these public airwaves. Um, right now, we are counting down a $1,000 challenge that's been put up by two of our listeners. Uh, and thanks to a, a collection of pledges that came in during that last section, we are now $500 away from making it. However, we've dropped down to just one caller on the line, and we have to go back to the show in, in a, a couple short minutes. So what we're asking you to do is to take two minutes out of your day and pledge quickly at 1-800-439-5732. You have a chance to make that pledge go further because of this challenge. You'll be getting in before uh, the deadline that we have to, to plan in early and to the fun drive. We want to free up as much of our airtime as possible for election coverage in the weeks to come. So you'd really be helping us out. And the third thing you'll be doing with that pledge is showing your support for East Bay yesterday. Um, I learned so much about the place I live from the show. I can't think of a more important thing for a community radio station like KPFA to be doing. And if you agree, we want you to join Ziggy, who just pledged from New York, she's part of the Bay Area Diaspora, part of the Diaspora, wow. the uh, Upsurge Jazz Ensemble. Join Chris, who just pledged from Oakland and said, keep up the good work, it's so important. Join Linda, who just pledged from East Palo Alto, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-5732. 
Hey, KPFA. Liam? Yeah, um, you know, I think that one of the things people might not think about when they're pledging is, you know, what exactly that money is going towards. And, you know, we've got to keep the the lights on in the station and pay the salaries and, and, you know, pay for the antenna and everything. But there's so much work that goes into keeping the radio station going, too. I mean, for folks listening to, uh, you know, this episode about the history of the Black Panther School right now, uh, I hope that they can tell uh, that, you know, it takes dozens and dozens of hours of research to, uh, you know, not only get these stories, but track people down and, you know, do the uh, interviews and then transcribe the interviews and then write the script. I mean, it's just so much work goes into bringing the, um, you know, the quality of storytelling and news that, that we try to bring here at KPFA and that I tried to bring, uh, you know, to the airwaves through East Bay yesterday. And so, you know, if you're listening right now, kind of thinking about, you know, does KPFA, you know, really need my support? Yes. Even, you know, $3 a month, $5 a month, even if you can only donate, you know, a handful of, um, of dollars, every little bit helps. And, and like Brian said, we're racing towards this goal of hitting $1,000 this hour. We're about halfway there, but we've only got about 18 minutes left. So um, the clock is ticking. And if you're worried about missing part of the program, don't worry. You can always log on to KPFA and hear the parts of the episode that you missed or, you know, tune in to the uh, East Bay Yesterday podcast that you can find at eastbayyesterday.com. So don't worry, you're not going to miss any of the story. If you're thinking about calling in to 1-800-HEY-KPFA and making your donation, now is the time to do it. 1-800-439-5732. We got about 80 seconds left till we go back to the program. We're asking you to join all the people who've pledged this hour so that KPFA can be here for you. And return the favor by pledging so that KPFA can be here for them. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. You know, history is so important of giving us a sense of who we are and where we come from. And, you know, being able to call BS when the conversations mm-hmm. happening in policy circles are, are just like retreads of, of things that have been happening for decades and have actually been worked out. I mean, it's just so incredible to think of, of Erica Huggins running this community school in Oakland where students are learning to calm themselves through meditation. And there's basically what we would call a restorative justice framework for right. discipline today. Um, people promoting this stuff now are calling it cutting edge because because we have erased our history. Uh, East Bay yesterday and KPFA are part of bringing that history back to the public, connecting it to our present. It's what it means to be a community institution. And it's what we're asking you to support by calling now at 1-800-439-5732. one 800 hey kpfa we're online at www.kpfa.org. Let's go back to East Bay yesterday. It's a real tragic part of American history when you really, really look back on what the Panthers were really trying to do, which was equality, equal rights. We don't want to be shot in the streets anymore. And here we are, you know, today. And that's the that's 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 the pain and the anger and the irony of where we are, because the cynical side is never changed. This is how it's always been. In many ways, Gregory is right. Every other week or so, there's a new video of someone, usually a black man, getting killed by the police. And just like when the Panthers first started, nearly all of these cops get away with it. This lack of progress, or maybe even regression, is happening in many schools too. The system is doing fine, it's doing exactly what you want it to do, and that is creating an underclass of black and brown and poor white kids that do not have the same opportunities as upper middle class and rich kids. That's the way the system is geared, that's the way our schools are geared, and there's no mistake in what the end result is. But Erica Huggins is still hopeful. She recently spoke at several events in Oakland as part of the 50th anniversary celebration of the founding of the Black Panthers. 
I asked her what she wants people to remember about the party that could help grow and strengthen today's movement. We were courageous enough to work across gender, class, sexual orientation, race, citizenship status lines before anybody was talking like that. Here we were, a bunch of young African-American men and women who were willing to look at complete freedom, freedom of the entire being. We worked with everybody. What we were concerned with is a united front. I think that the Black Panther Party will live forever in the hearts of people because of our intention and our love for people. So, and the school is a shining example of that. There's one more story I want to include in this episode. It's not East Bay history, though, so that's why I'm tacking it on at the end here. But it's really important because it helps explain the mindset of the Panther generation. The people who started the party were really putting their lives on the line, and many of them were killed for their beliefs, including Erica's husband, John Huggins. Anyway, stories like this one from Rod help explain why people are willing to live, fight, and die for the cause. Let me give you a little background. That that My father was part of the (laughs) unsung heroes of the Tuskegee Airmen. They were basically two groups, the fighter pilots, the red tails. They went overseas and fought the Germans and were very successful. There was another group, the 477th, which was the bomber pilots, okay? And my father was a bombardier navigator in the 477th. And in April of 1945, he was part of the 101 officers that got arrested for trying to integrate the the officers club. Major Selway was the commander and he made a base regulation which basically said that there was one officers club for the trainers and there was another officers club for the trainees that was a code for trainers were white trainees were black and so it was a segregate it was a, a effort to segregate the clubs and he was a segregationist and did not believe in the mixing of the races all of the officers black and white were ordered to sign this base regulation. 101 of the black officers refused to sign the base regulation. They were arrested. They were sent from Freeman Field, that's where it happened, to Godman Field. As my father said, the barracks that they had been in before, they had put concertina wires around it. They had guard posts at four corners, floodlights, and they got off the train there and there were uh, German and Italian prisoners with peas on their backs walking around freely and they were incarcerated. That was what turned my father into a freedom fighter. And he spent the rest of his life advocating for equality of treatment, for following the laws of the land. And he taught all three of his sons to be freedom fighters. If you're interested in more details on this story, look up Freeman Field Mutiny. To help preserve his dad's legacy, Rod Gilead is currently the president of the West Coast branch of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. That's it for this week's episode of East Bay Yesterday. Thanks for listening. I've been your host, Liam O'Donohue. And that leaves us just a couple minutes at the end of the hour here uh, to raise the final balance on our $1,000 challenge during East Bay yesterday. Um, Where things stand, we are at $190 to go. So close. Uh, If we can just raise that final $190, we bring in an extra thousand for KPFA, Uh, but the clock is almost run out. 
You can help us by taking just two minutes out of your day. Pledge online at kpfa.org or pick up the phone and call 1-800-439-5732. You'll be doing three things. Uh, you'll be leveraging your contribution because of the challenge. It's, it's like giving more to KPFA than you dig out of your own wallet. You'll be showing your support for, for this program for East Bay yesterday. Bringing history to bear on understanding our present and the place we live could not be more important. You can take care of it by calling right now, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. You'll be joining Nancy, who just pledged from Oakland, and Dharma, who called in a call from San Mateo, and Joan in San Juan Bautista, Lynn in Occidental, and Anjali, who pledged from San Francisco and says, great show as usual. And I will say to all of the men listening out there, where are you, boys? 1-800-439-5732. Liam? You know, uh, I just want to take a minute to offer my own little appreciation for, for KPFA because, um, you know, as... I think we all recognize there are so many chapters of American history, even local history, that are so uncovered or covered in such a skewed way. And there's very few media outlets or radio stations that would give East Bay yesterday the space to you know, spend an hour, for example, digging into the history of the Black Panthers Community School, um, you know, not focusing on the kind of more sensational stories that have been covered, uh, you know, or that have covered the Black Panthers in the past, and um, you know, it just feels like such a good fit for. Oops, got to close my window. Sorry about that. As you all know, helicopters flying over Oakland is a frequent. Um, operational hazard that we have here and now that we're all broadcasting from home that's something we have to deal with but as i was saying kpfa is just the best and that is why in these last few minutes that we have in the hour right now we need to close that gap of 190 dollars uh that we're short to reach that thousand dollar matching goal and uh like you said, Brian, we've got to uh, ask some of the men out there to pull their weight when it comes to hitting this uh, fund driving uh, matching goal. And, you know, my favorite part of, uh, you know, your little updates when you're thanking all the callers who have donated so far and brought us closer to this goal is when you mention all the places that they're calling in from. Um, I mean, it's just so gratifying and exciting for me to know that, you know, this little show that I produce in Oakland, mostly in, you know, my own bedroom, is uh, reaching people uh, throughout Northern California, throughout the United States, and throughout the world. And uh, with all those callers out there, can we please uh, just get a little more help to hit that goal? Once again, the number is one 800 439 5732. I'll repeat it one more time. 1 800 439 5732. Keep KPFA on the air. Keep East Bay yesterday on KPFA. And for goodness sakes, let's uh, hit this goal so we can end the fun drive sooner rather than later. What do you think, Brian? I am so, so down with that. Um, <laughs> as for extent, we've got Less than four minutes left. Three callers on the line. No Ooh. thumbs up on the challenge yet, but we know we're getting close. So we're asking you to make sure that we go over the top. 1-800-439-5732. That is 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Or online at www.kpfa.org. And, and I'll say something I've said a few times during this fun drive. Um, we're in the midst of a massive economic crisis for a big chunk of the population. The, the word they're throwing around now is a K-shaped recovery, where a lot of folks with professional jobs are doing just fine. The direct deposits happening every other week, probably seeing more savings rack up in your bank account than at any time in the past because you can't go out and spend it on the weekends. There's nothing open to spend it on. And then we also know that the state of California has 1.5 million unemployment claims it hasn't even processed yet. Those mostly represent people who are not only out of work, but the meager assistance they're entitled to from the state uh, hasn't even hit their bank account. Now, what that means for us is that there are a lot of people counting on us who would normally chip in something to keep KPFA going, who can't right now. 
Um, and what we're asking you to do is to pledge on their behalf. If you're doing okay, right? If, if you're checking your bank balance and kind of surprised by how much it's gone up, give more. Give more than you would ordinarily. If you're, if you're someone who only gives intermittently, sign up to be a KPFA sustainer. So we have a, a solid monthly commitment that we can count on, that we can plan around, that we can use to shorten the length of our fund drives. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. KPFA is what happens when we all pull together. And each one of us does what we can according to our ability. And then we as a station do what we can for everyone according to their need. Um, we're asking you to link up hands with the people who've pledged already this hour. With the two people who put up that staggeringly large thousand dollar challenge. And with everybody who's counting on KPFA right now, we have just two minutes to go. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. Liam? Yeah, you know, when you were talking about this K-shaped recovery, it just, uh, you know, it's making me think of all the headlines I've been seeing in the news lately about how the rich keep getting richer. You know, the people who are, uh, you know, in the Forbes top 400 list, list, the Jeff Bezoses and Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, this pandemic has been good for them actually financially because so much uh, of life has moved to the virtual now. So, you know, if you're one of these tech companies, times are better than ever. But for the rest of us, the people, um, you know, that don't have uh, giant stock holdings or aren't um, you know, reaping the benefits of, of life moving to this kind of virtual plane. Um, we are going to need political leaders uh, at the local, federal, and state level who are going to make sure that uh, this recovery uh, is being met with the kind of policies that will make sure that people aren't being left behind. And where you're going to hear people advocating for those policies and fighting for the financial benefits to um, you know, reach working people or people that are unemployed right now are on stations like KPFA. You're not going to hear it very many other places. So if you want to keep the station um, thriving as a place for independent critical voices um, that aren't just, you know, working for lobbyists or, you know, the type of people that you're going to hear on Fox News, um, now is the time because we've only got about a minute left. And I know we're getting close to that goal. But like you said, Brian, we've got to get over the top. So 1-800-439-4732 is a number to call. There's about a minute or so left to make your donation and uh, every single dollar counts. So please pick up the phone and call right now. That's 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. Join Mary, who just pledged from Oakland. Thank you, Mary. I uh, joined the anonymous donor in San Francisco who wanted to shout out uh, Letters in Politics, the Talkies, Herbal Highway, and Music of the World. Thank you for your eclectic KPFA consumption habits. Uh, 30 seconds left to go over the top on that $1,000 challenge. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. This is a community announcement for September 2020. The Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition calls for a bike to do wherever day on Thursday, September 24th. When you register, you can get a Love to Ride app, participate virtually in special events, and enter a drawing for prizes. To register, go to bikesonoma.org. That's bikesonoma.org. This community announcement is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your listening for consideration to KPFA at 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley 94704, or email calendar at kpfa.org. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621, or view it online at kpfa.org. In the next 70, 70, years, 70 years, years, the people will rise up and the gun lobby will collapse. No-nonsense gun legislation will take hold and school shootings, suicide, domestic violence, and murder rates will evaporate. More common sense and less need for thoughts and prayers. In the next 70 years, your fiercely independent radio station will be here to cover it for you. For you. For you. 94.1 FM, KPFA.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.